So one of the things that we're beginning to look at, because we, we now have, uh, considering Neil did the first implant even before I got to Mount Sinai in 1990, we do our very best to get patients in, and, and we do have patients 15 to 20 years of follow-up. We, we're trying our hardest to get them. And the one thing that I'm noticing, and th this talk will change in, in a year or two, is that uh, this disease has a very long natural history. And you will be surprised by following patients out for a long time. And, and I think one of the downfalls of some of these newer, newer technologies is recommendations to jump on the bandwagon um, without really having long, any long-term follow-up to really tell you what's going on. Uh, so this was actually a paper, so even though it was out now nine years ago, um, at that time we did have very long follow-up since we started in 1990. And we were really looking at um, the patterns of recurrence, distal, local recurrences, in patients and subsets of patients from our database of brachytherapy. That's brachytherapy alone, brachytherapy with hormone therapy, and brachytherapy with uh, combination with external beam, and kind of looking at what what happened to these patients. So, if we just took in this in this particular paper, we had 184 patients with a PSA failure, and we just wanted to look at who these patients were. So, as you would expect. You know, 22% were low-risk patients, 14% were intermediate. There was no difference there, but most of the patients that had failed were high-risk patients. That's, that's nothing that's very surprising, but this is what we saw. Um, again, looking at the pro profile of these 184 PSA failures, uh, we looked at, and someone had said yesterday that doubling time wasn't it's uh, out of fashion and we don't use it anymore. But in our database and some of the abstracts we've put out in the last year or so, and the one that I, that I presented at Astro, the doubling time actually was the, single mo the best predictor of mortality uh, after, after treatment. So this was, in these 184 patients, uh, a profile of their PSA doubling time. So the worst patients, those with doubling times less than three months, uh, represented 21% of our patients, 17% had three to six months, 16% um, were six to 10 months, and the largest percentage of these patients um, from this series, you know, published in 2008, had a long doubling time of 46% 40, uh, of them had doubling times greater than 10 months. So this is uh, another thing we looked at, and, and uh, and I credit Neil for this because he was insistent in the beginning of our brachytherapy program to do post-treatment prostate biopsies. So uh, when Neil retired or uh, even before that, I think when we had gotten a lot of this information, we stopped doing routine biopsies on every one or two years. But we still continue to do patients who have a rising PSA and try to get a biopsy. Um, and this, this is an interesting uh, phenomenon. I'll talk about it later. I, I don't know about other people that do brachytherapy, but the thing that I hear from patients most often, the most common thing that a urologist will tell a patient is that, and they, urologists typically don't uh, discern brachytherapy from radiation. So everything is radiation, right? And, and so what is told to them, look, if you have surgery, you can have postoperative radiation. But if you have radiation, you can't have surgery. Right? How many people have heard that from their patients? A lot of people. A lot of people. So, so what I have to then try to tell them is some of this biopsy data, which it's very hard sometimes for them to understand. When I say, yes, it is more difficult to do radiation after ra uh, surgery after radiation or brachytherapy, the need that you will have to have that because you have a positive biopsy is very, very low. And that's when they kind of, there's a blank look, and I realize I... I've lost already, but anyway. So this is basically looking at 106 patients who had a prostate biopsy and, looking, and relating that uh, to the PSA doubling time. So relating the PSA doubling time of the patients to the likelihood of having a positive biopsy two or more years after treatment. So interestingly, which you would inherently think that doesn't make sense, the worst players, I said, were doubling times less than three months. Uh, none of those patients were positive. Why is that? 
uh, three to six months, none of those patients were, had a positive biopsy. But in patients who had a doubling time from six to 10 months, it was 30%. And if the doubling time was greater than 10 months, they had a 49%. Again, this is from the very start of our, our series in 1990. It included patients that had lower um, uh, D90 or biologic effective doses during the learning curve. So what it's saying is that the when your doubling time is long, you're more likely to have a local failure. Local failures, as I'll show you, are, are, uh, occur with, uh, they, they, the PSAs go up slowly. While these patients, the blue and the red bars, are patients that have very aggressive tumors, they were more likely to be treated with combination therapy, with uh, biologic effective doses and high D90s. And when we biopsy them, trimodality therapy, it's mostly negative, even though, the, as I said earlier, they, they represent a larger percentage of the failures. But those patients, when you see a patient with a Gleason 8 to 10 and you say you want to do an implant or radiation and the surgeon gives you that line, you have to try to tell them, no, this is the result. The likelihood, if your PSA goes up, we can do saturation biopsies on you. We're not going to find positive biopsies. I think our total positive biopsy rate with combination therapy now is less than 1%. So again, here's some of the predictors of having a positive biopsy from this particular series of patients. If the BED overall was greater than 150, it was 24%. Again, this is in a subset. Every one of these patients had a positive biopsy, has had a rising PSA, and a BED less than equal to 150. Um, the blue line, it was 44%. So again, if your doses are lower, you're much more likely to have a positive biopsy. We know that from external beam biopsy data, um, that, uh, you know, that the, bi the, the, the likelihood of having a positive biopsy is much greater as the total dose you give is much lower. So again, this is uh, what I said earlier. In, in the 106 patients uh, in this series that had a biopsy, those patients that had an implant alone had a 45% chance of having a positive biopsy, 37 with an implant and hormones, but if you had an implant and radiation, that high BED was zero. Um, in terms of distant metastases from this particular paper, we had 37 patients that developed clinical uh, metastatic disease. Uh, it, it just happened that 14 of those patients also underwent prostate biopsies, and again, most of the patients that, that are developing metast metastatic disease during that time are, are high-risk patients. Most of them got combined therapy, and so their biopsies were negative, 100%. And the 10-year actual freedom from developing metastatic disease was 76% in this subset of patients with rising PSA. So as was mentioned earlier, um, again, this is actuarially at 10 years, but many of these patients, even though they just have a rising PSA, will go on, and I'll show you some updated data at the end of the talk. Uh, which is a little higher, to have metastatic disease. So local control, again, very, very important. This is looking at the effect of, of the time of PSA failure on the development of distant METs. I find this still very, very interesting, and that is if your, if your PSA failure is occurring greater than three years after your initial treatment, you only had a 4% chance uh, actuarial out by 14 years of developing metastatic disease. Um, on the other hand, if, you had, if your PSA uh, went up um, less than one year, you had only a 58% chance of avoiding having metastatic disease. So early PSA failures are more consistent with uh, aggressive disease and the risk of dying of metastatic prostate. Again, we can take that and just um, tie it into to what Bill was saying, which is that in these patients with high-risk disease, have radical prostatectomy, even though we're catching it with an ultra-sensitive assay. The PSA is going up, and it typically is going up um, before the first year. Those patients need to be treated. Otherwise, they're at super high risk developing metastatic disease. What about the effect of the PSL doubling time on developing distant METs? Again, very similar. If you were in that group that have a very short PSA doubling time, less than three months, only 22% are free from developing metastatic disease. On the other hand, if your doubling time is greater than 10 months, uh, only 8% of patients develop metastatic disease. Again, consistent with what you would think, Gleason score is 8 to 10, 50% will develop metastatic disease, while uh, Gleason scores, although this is actually contrary to, I guess, what was said, that didn't we hear that yesterday, that no one developed metastatic disease in the observation cohort with Gleason 6? So at least in our cohort, we are getting some patients, again, with PSA failure, 10% uh, will develop uh, metastatic disease by 14 years. Um, this is looking at risk group. 
So again, if you're intermediate, low risk, it's a low risk of developing metastatic disease, but high risk, uh, just having high risk features alone, 30% uh, will develop metastatic disease. Again, treatment group. So the trimodality patients, which we were basically doing high intermediate and high risk patients, when they fail, again, they tend to fail early, they tend to fail with a very short doubling time, and 65% of them develop metastatic disease by 10 years. So this was an interesting topic, which I think is something that, that we're focusing on with our database, uh, which is really trying to understand uh, when we have patients with a rising PSA, where it's coming from. And this was a great paper um, by uh, Zumsteg et al. from Memorial Michael Zalewski's group looking at anatomical patterns of recurrence following uh, by a PSA relapse uh, in, the, in dose escalation era of external beam radiations. It's not a brachytherapy cohort. So it says, so interesting, unlike the data I was just mentioning, the prostate was the most common first site of recurrence in low and intermediate risk patients treated with external beam radiation therapy, with instances as high as almost 15%. The eight-year risk of having an isolated pelvic lymph node relapse as first recurrence was 0, 1, and 3% respectively. So again, what's kind of interesting is that that's in the high-risk group, is that a pelvic recurrence in the setting, in the setting, it's kind of interesting, of poor local control, and I would say 15% is poor local control, is not always the first sight with standard imaging, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. It's not very hard, it's very hard to detect those lymph nodes. Um, so again, in, in the 474 patients with clinically detected recurrence, the most common first recurrence site, again, was local in 55, was bone in 33%, pelvic nodes in 21%, and abdominal nodes in 9%. Uh, unique relapse distribution uh, that was local uh, in 46%, lymph nodes in 9%, and bone in 20%. So again, conclusion was anatomical recurrence pattern was the strongest predictor of prostate cancer-specific mortality on multivariate analysis. So a very interesting thing, that prostate cancer-specific mortality here, you have local lymph node failure, bone failure, and having multifocal failure sites. And again, it's all quite intuitive and makes a quite a bit of sense. Local failure alone, like I had mentioned and kind of ties in what I showed, just the local failure alone uh, was probably most likely in low as you look closer into the data, low-risk patients or low or low-intermediate risk patients who are less likely to develop metastatic disease and die of prostate cancer. Um, and you can see they had the lowest risk of prostate cancer-specific mortality. Well, obviously, if you have either bone metastases or bone plus other sites, multifocal, you're at the highest risk of actually dying of prostate cancer. And the lymph node group is quite interesting because it's getting up there and it's getting close. So again, this is a group I think we're going to have to pay attention to and that all the data we have on treating lymph nodes, it's been so confusing based on, on, on our randomized data. But um, basically what I'm going to tell you is that the stuff that we are beginning to do that I'm absolutely fascinating is typical patient that I would see, the rare patient that got combination therapy, Gleason 7s typically, having failures five, six, seven, eight, nine years prior to this year, I would say, is that we would basically take those patients and biopsy them, biopsy negative, image them negative, and just follow them, figure out what to do. Sometimes they went on hormone therapy, and now we've begun to use the Axiomen or Blue Earth PET scan. Um, there's a choline PET in the Cleveland Clinic, and I think new uh, prostate-specific membrane uh, antibody tests. These things are now showing in these patients isolated nodal metastatic disease. And you could never see this before. You just had a situation. This is what's fascinating to me. That's why I brought this study up, because it is interesting to note that I think these patients maybe potentially uh, can be salvaged, but if you don't, if we kind of just do nothing, put them on hormone therapies, they may have a relatively high risk of dying of prostate cancer. Again, this is a, the most recent update that we uh, presented. At the, we will present uh, an updated version of this at the AUA this year, um, which is looking at the patterns of recurrence, again, in another subset of patients. Now we have 265 patients in the database with PSA failures. And I think earlier I had showed you in those patients, the likelihood of, of developing metastatic disease was 25%. Was, 
Yeah, it was about uh, 25%, 75% did not, 25%. But now that we're out with much longer follow-up, we see that the freedom from development in metastatic disease with longer follow-up is only 45%. So 55% of these patients with PSA failures, as we follow them out to 15 years, will develop metastatic disease. And we kind of look at the, re the recurrence patterns outside of the prostate, uh, which is in our brachytherapy series, the most common, unlike the external beam data that I had showed you, as you could see, the most common site of, meta of recurrent sites is bone. But again, there's that interesting 20%. And again, this is before the use of these newer imaging modalities. So I think that number is going to be higher. Then it calls into question, what is the role of doing prophylactic pelvic RT? Why is it that that never has shown a benefit? I don't have an answer to that, but it, it is quite interesting to me. So this is a paper that Neil uh, published just kind of uh, looking again at the biopsy uh, data that we have from the, from the database. So it included 586 patients who underwent a post-treatment prostate biopsy. Uh, and again, with the higher BEDs now this time, this is what you were referring to, of a greater than 200, which is pretty much what we get when you do a combination therapy of an implant and radiation. The positive biopsy rate is 1.6%. So I said one, he said two. The actual number is 1.6%. <laughs> um, and but then again, if you're if you're doing maybe implant alone or you're not achieving these high doses, and, and it's been brought up quite a bit, it, the data really uh, bears out the much higher positive biopsy rate in the lo lower biologic effective dose calculations. So I think that's it. Again, I think it's a fascinating time for those of us that have been doing brachy for a long time with these newer imaging modalities to really kind of figure out the natural history of prostate cancer, which, we, as we know, is really, really, really long. So again. One caution is if you're doing a new treatment modality, you got to be aware that you need this long-term follow-up to really kind of get a sense of, of what's, what's going on. Thank you.